Hello there, and welcome to the second lesson uh, that's going to be going over uh, the key topics that you need to know for your uh, PL4 combined aviation exam that's going to be happening next week. Uh, right now, we're just going to be going over air navigation. Uh, so this is uh, one of the five key points. Uh, this is going to be the, the second lesson, or rather review session. Uh, once again, uh, not necessarily all of the topics that I cover in this video uh, will be on your exam, and this video is not guaranteed to cover absolutely everything on your exam, uh, but it's going to be a very helpful guide to make sure that you do understand all of the key concepts and, and know what to be studying. All right, so uh, just to go over what this, uh, what this video is going to go, go through, uh, we're going to be going over uh, navigation basics, uh, air navigation charts, map reading and flight planning. Uh, flight planning isn't very important, it's, it's very condensed, it's just going to be a little thing at the end um, and it, it doesn't come up too much really on the exam. So uh, the basics, uh, we need to know what the earth is, we need to know uh, our definitions and what parallels and meridians are, so that's where we're going to start. So uh, the basic principles of air navigation, uh, it's, it's essentially the same as following a uh, a map or directions that someone would give you. Uh, so you need to, before you leave for somewhere that you've never been to before, uh, you need to know where you are, uh, where it is you're going, what uh, path you're going to take and any stops you're going to make along the way, uh, any landmarks that might help you get there, uh, how fast you should be going. Uh, that's So your, your speed is something that's, that's a little bit more specific to the aviation side of things, but it's important uh, more so than, than just driving somewhere. Uh, and how you're going to to make your your controls and your your movements. What happens if you get off track? Uh, not so much taking a wrong turn, but uh, uh, one of the big examples that we're going to be going over is let's say you're you're traveling and you end up uh, three miles to uh, to the west of where you're supposed to be, uh, and you're you're halfway to your destination. Like how do you correct for that? All right. So here we have a diagram of the Earth, and you can see it's segmented. Uh, if I can get my little laser pointer here, uh, into a whole bunch of lines. So we've got uh, these lines that go down like this, and we've got these lines that go across. You'll notice that these lines, these vertical ones, aren't all in line with each other. They converge at the poles, whereas these lines here, they're all very evenly spaced. I don't have a way to show you with my fingers or anything, but the distance between each one of these lines, if you look at them, is the same. Uh, so all of these parallel lines, and we'll get to why they're called that. Uh, so yeah, uh, the Earth is a sphere. Uh, not strictly true. Uh, if you want the technical term, it is an oblate spheroid. However, when it comes to aviation, we don't care. Uh, the oblate spheroid definition is, is a technicality. Uh, you're not going to be circumnavigating the globe. Uh, and even if you were, uh, there, there aren't very many key calculations because you'd, you'd be splitting that into uh, shorter distances to, to make sure that that's not really a factor. Uh, a graticule, uh, graticule is uh, these, these intersecting circles. Um, not really important what you know, to know what that is. Uh, it's going to be uh, great circles and rum lines and all that fun stuff that, that is really important. Uh, so the Earth rotates on its axis from west to east. Uh, a good way to think about this is the way the sun sets. Uh, if you're not familiar with how the sun's, uh, with how the sun rises and sets, uh, a good kind of mnemonic or, or whatever a, a saying to help make sure you don't lose track of that is uh, the sun is like bread. Uh, it rises in the yeast, so in yeast like east, and it sets in the waste because like if you eat a lot of bread you'll put on weight. Uh, waste, west, that's the, the equivalencies there. I know it's dumb, but it's dumb enough that it really sticks in your mind. You keep thinking to yourself, wow, that's a really dumb comparison, but it's so prominent that you won't forget it. Uh, so, so remember that. Magnetism. Uh, the Earth is a magnet. Uh, this diagram is wrong. Uh, the, the south pole of, of our Earth is actually here up at the north. Uh, and then uh, that's uh, the north end of this magnet should be down at the bottom uh, because we have our, our magnetic field that comes out of the top and circles to the bottom. Why this is, is just because of convention. We didn't realize that the earth was actually, like the entire earth was a magnet uh, and our convention was that north was up to, to this side of the globe and south was down this way. Uh, and later, and we set those definitions of how those uh, 
uh, those fields radiate outward. Uh, and then afterward, we found out that uh, we'd messed it up and it was kind of too late. Uh, we're not going to change this to South America and this to North. So, so just be aware of that. This diagram is not correct. Air navigation definitions. Uh, it's important to go over these, uh, make sure you, you understand these. So first things first, headings. Uh, so the heading is the direction in which the longitudinal axis of an aircraft is pointed. If you remember from your like level one and level two classes on what uh, the longitudinal axis of the aircraft is, uh, think of it essentially as where your nose is pointing, well, where the, the nose of the aircraft is pointing. Uh, generally, it's expressed in degrees uh, clockwise from the north. So if we've got, if you can imagine here, like I can draw, can't I? Yes, I can annotate. So if we've got our Earth, uh, and we've got north and we've got south. And I apologize for the horrendousness of this drawing. If you are flying your plane uh, so like this and you're going on this angle and this is north, whatever this angle here, that's going to be your, your heading uh, compared to true north. So this, this little angle here uh, between those two lines. Uh, and so that would be measured in angles uh, you could say uh, you're heading, let's say, 10 degrees uh, north, uh, northwest, um, I mean, say north by northwest, uh, or you can say you are heading, you have a heading of 350 degrees, because 360 degrees would obviously be all the way around, uh, so 10 degrees less than that around to here is 350 degrees, which does fall in the, uh, uh, the northwestern range. Uh, so can I clear that? There we go, it's gone. All right, uh, so uh, I, I hope that's pretty straightforward. Now we're going to get into what a uh, true heading, a magnetic heading, and a compass heading is, because it sounds like those things should be equivalent, but they're not. Okay, there we go. All right. So your, your true heading uh, is where you're actually pointing relative to true north. I apologize for skipping ahead to the other slide. Uh, your magnetic heading is going to be according to magnetic north uh, because as you've definitely covered before, magnetic and true north are not the same. Uh, true north is the geographical north and south pole based on the, the equators. Uh, the equator is plural. Uh, the equator, uh, we just have one, and uh, it's average throughout the year. Uh, so generally the the actual like the, the heat equator, so where it's actually hottest on the earth at a certain time of year, can vary uh, I think about 15 degrees in either direction. That's why we have the, the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Those are the upper and lower bounds of our equator and that average is right in the middle uh, and that's where we measure our true uh, indicator from. Uh, magnetic is going to follow your, um, is going to follow your uh, magnetic north, which is where that uh, magnetic field comes out of the Earth. Remember, in this direction, not in this direction. Uh, and, and that's what your uh, magnetic heading is. And your compass heading sounds like it should be the same as your magnetic heading, but it's not. Your compass heading is going to be the heading given to you by your compass, which is uh, largely influenced by your magnetic heading, but can also be affected by things like declination, um, and more importantly, uh, well, not all necessarily more importantly, but equally importantly, uh, other uh, ferrous metal objects inside the aircraft uh, or that are part of the aircraft. Excuse me. Um, so yeah, uh, if you don't remember, a ferrous metal is, is any kind of metal that has magnetic properties. Uh, generally, we just consider that to be iron, uh, nickel, and, and another that's uh, slipping my mind right now. All right. Uh, headings, variation. Uh, so I mentioned there's uh, some, some things that can, uh, uh, can change. So your variation is uh, the difference uh, or the angle rather between your true and magnetic meridians. Uh, so here we've got the North Pole and here we have the magnetic North Pole. This is obviously an exaggeration, um, but here we have our variation to the east and then there you can see it's the same uh, where it can be to the west. Uh, there's uh, two spots on the globe, theoretically, where there's uh, zero variation, uh, but sometimes there are more, sometimes there are less, and we've actually got one that does run right through uh, North America, and I think it, it does come up on one of the later slides. Uh, it's unfortunately not here, uh, so we do need to account for variation uh, here in most parts of Canada, and especially around Ottawa. 
deviation. Uh, so I mentioned this. Uh, so there's a difference between your compass heading and your magnetic heading. Uh, so you've got um, a deviation card actually to, to help you solve for this. Uh, so we call this a four steer card. Uh, so basically, if you want to take this magnetic heading, you need to steer this heading. Uh, so north zero, uh, 30 becomes 28 and 60 becomes 57. Uh, so do you see how, I hope you can see how this works. This is zero degrees, 30, 60, 90, 120, 150. Uh, and then we just have the, the rest of them here. Uh, so these numbers for the steer uh, are going to be unique to every single aircraft. Anytime an aircraft gets brought in for, for an overhaul, uh, they, they redo these calculations and they make sure that their four steer cards are uh, completely accurate uh, just to, to that one degree. Uh, so if you want to go in this particular aircraft, if you want to fly a heading of, uh, let's say you want to head directly west, you would set your compass heading to be uh, 274. Uh, and that's going to result in you actually following a track of uh, west uh, according to, to your magnetic. It won't be true west necessarily, but it will be, be uh, magnetic west. Great circles. I mentioned this briefly before. Uh, a great circle is any circle around the globe uh, that uh, intersects the sphere uh, with the plane going right through its center. So essentially what that means is it's just like the equator. The equator is found at the largest point on the Earth. Uh, so if I've got a, a ball here, uh, if you take a look at this basketball, we've got essentially an equator around it. It's this one line that goes all the way around uh, and it is at the thickest point of the ball. If it were up here, uh, if it were like up here and it ran around here, that is still a circle, but it's not a great circle because it's not at that thickest point. You can have a great circle that uh, goes in the opposite direction. So you can see there's, uh, I'm just pointing on the wrong side here. So we've got this one that goes all the way around, or we've got this one, which goes all the way around like this. Uh, those are both great circles. Um, but uh, anything else that that's, doesn't go around the full circumference is not. Uh, again, this does assume the Earth is a is a perfect sphere. Uh, not that important. It's it's but it is. You do need to know what a, a great circle is. That's uh, so the largest circle drawn on the surface of a sphere. Um, so yeah. Uh, if you need to get from one place to another on a sphere. Uh, so if you remember, uh, straightest place on a flat surface, uh, if you've got a, I've got a piece of paper here, draw a pen. If I've got this piece of paper and I want to get from point A to point B, uh, that may be reflected, I don't want to go like this because I'm adding all this extra length. The, the easiest way, and I'm facing away from this, so I apologize if I miss, straightest way is from point A to point B. No extra turns, no, no detours. You want to get from point A to point B, a straight line is always going to be the fastest. This applies to spheres as well. Uh, if you want to get from one point to another, uh, you will take a great circle. That is the straightest line between two points. Uh, don't get fancy and try and think, well, if I want to go from, let's say on this sphere here, if I want to go from this point to this point, well, I can just follow this circle, right? If you actually want to go the fastest uh, and the shortest distance, you'd want to take the great circle that passes through both of those points. So it would probably go around something like through this angle and you'd end up going up quite high or higher than you'd expect uh, in, in order to, to achieve that. It's very interesting stuff. So here you can see on a Mercator projection, which I'm sure your, your instructors have gone over, uh, why it, it's not the most accurate in terms of portraying landforms, but it is useful, uh, especially in terms of aviation. Here you can see someone following a great circle to travel from Ottawa to India. Uh, so you can see how high they go in order to follow that great circle. And it doesn't seem like it's the fastest route, but believe it or not, it actually is. That's, that's the shortest geographical distance between those two points. Spheres are cool. Isogonic lines. So uh, here is where I've talked about uh, those variation lines. And this is where you can see that agonic line where there's, there's no variation. Um, so this is just a way of showing on your map uh, where variation occurs. Uh, so between each of these lines, uh, you can see you've got a variation of five degrees here, 
10 degrees to the west, 15 all the way up. Um, this is uh, a very easy mnemonic. I'm sure your instructor's gone over this before. West is best, meaning you'd add it to your, your, your heading. And east is least, meaning you'd subtract it because it's going the, the other way. Uh, yeah, so when I did my flight training in Thetford Mines, we had, uh, a, uh, we had a variation of 14 degrees until our maps expired partway through the course. Uh, and that variation became 13. Uh, so these do shift and change over uh, the course of each year. Uh, they, they do change and scientists measure them uh, regularly uh, to, to monitor the, the Earth's activity and everything. Uh, and they are in reference to true north, uh, not uh, magnetic. It seems counterintuitive, but there's, there's a method to the madness. Uh, so here, uh, agonic lines, I already mentioned, uh, it's this red line here. It's where if you're following that, uh, there is no variation along them. And you'll notice that it's actually not uh, a perfectly straight line. Even if you were talking about great circles and stuff, it does make bends and turns and things. Uh, and that, uh, that doesn't matter uh, because this is where the, uh, the magnetic fields aren't interacting uh, with it or they're, they're interacting in such a way that both directions cancel each other out. Rum lines. So this is, this is an example of just a, a regular line crossing across the points here. Uh, and this is, as you can see, it's not a Mercator projection. Uh, it's, it's the wrong type of projection to be using a rum line accurately because it's crossing each line at a different angle and we don't want that. So here uh, we've got an actual rum line. So you can see the difference this is a perfectly straight line uh, on a curved map uh, as opposed to a curved line on a curved map. So this is a great circle uh, where it's going to be crossing all meridians at the same angle. Uh, so if you look here, the difference between this and this is 45 degrees, got a 45 degree there, 45 degree there. Whereas if you look here, you can see this is, this looks like it's about 45 degrees between this line, oh, between this line and this line. And then here, all of a sudden it's a little steeper and then a little steeper and then it's past 90 degrees and it's, it looks like it's curving down. You can see the space is getting bigger here when it was getting smaller before. So these are the easiest lines to steer uh, as opposed to constantly adjusting your heading. Like here's the 72, then 87, then 102. If you're trying to follow that line on a map, uh, it would be a real pain uh, having to adjust for that every, every well, I mean, it could be a few minutes to a few hours depending on uh, what you're flying and where you're flying. Uh, yeah, so very, very useful in navigation. So there are problems with the rum line. Uh, so here you can see we've got a great circle. Uh, so this is the shortest path, as we discussed. Uh, this is the rum line that travels there. So this does cut through all meridians at the same angle. But, uh, so you can see here, this is, uh, I don't know what that would be, maybe 70 degrees or so uh, between these two here. Uh, and it's always staying at 70 degrees as opposed to this great circle, which cuts through each of them. Uh, and you end up adding over 100 nautical miles to fly from, that looks like Montreal or so, to, uh, I guess it's like Normandy-ish. And um, yeah, so so the, the difference here is important. So in one case, you've got your fastest route, and here you've got your easiest to navigate. When you're, you're flying IFR and you have machines that can do all this, these calculations for you, uh, then it's, it's reasonable to, um, to take the great circle instead and have those corrections made in flight to save some fuel and travel that much less. Uh, but on, on smaller flights uh, where those rum lines can result in constant adjustments to your, your track, uh, they're, or sorry, where those great circles uh, can result in constant adjustments, they, uh, they are less than ideal. Direction. Uh, I'm sure you guys have gone over this before as well. Uh, direction is measured in degrees and we have our cardinal points on the compass. So we've got north, east, east, south, west, uh, and then the next secondary points are northeast, southeast, southwest, and northwest. Uh, just remember that north and south take priority and then east and west. Uh, and then here we've got our next set of subdivisions. So we have north by northeast is the proper way to, to say that. Uh, we've got north, uh, northeast by north uh, here, uh, east by southeast, uh, south by southeast, south by southwest, west by southwest, west by northwest, and north by northwest. Make sense? Cool. All right. 
Um, so yeah, that's this direction is pretty straightforward. I'm sure you're you're all familiar with that. Lambert conformal conic projection. Uh, this is a type of map projection that I'm sure you're familiar with. So imagine if you were standing at the very center of the Earth and projected a beam outward onto a uh, a cone shape. Uh, this is what you'd end up with. A uh, great circle on a Lambert conformic conic. Uh, I mispronounced that, and I apologize. Uh, is a straight line. It's very easy that way to 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 figure things out. Uh, so if you want to travel here from from the Rockies up to I guess it would be like kind of North Bay, perfectly straight line. Is it's easy to follow? Uh, it makes sense. Uh, bearing. So the bearing of uh, an object is its position relative to where you're flying. Uh, so if you're flying here on a heading of directly north, and there's this object or the station, I guess, uh, labeled here, 30 degrees off, its bearing relative to you is 30 degrees. As you fly closer to it, let's say you get up to this point here. Uh, it's going to be at a bearing of 90 degrees. It's going to be directly to your east. So you need to be aware that it does change as you approach. Magnetic dip, uh, something to be aware of when you're flying uh, up north. Uh, so you can see here, there's not really any dip around the poles. Uh, it's not too much of a factor either here around our latitude. We're at, uh, we're at 45 degrees in Ottawa. And um, just be aware that uh, because of how those magnetic fields curve in, they do start to affect uh, the way your, your compass reacts. Uh, so this is uh, a breakdown of the compass. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. It's just some, uh, suspended in a, uh, a liquid, usually kerosene, uh, to, to keep it in place like that. So uh, this is how that, that dip happens. Uh, so your gravity ends up pushing the, uh, uh, the card down, or the, uh, the cup, the, uh, the actual compass itself. Uh, inside that fluid, and you can see that one end ends up lower uh, compared to the other. And so we do have systems in place to, to help prevent that. Uh, so here you can just read this. So it's the, the angle between the horizontal plane of the magnet or compass under the influence of a non-horizontal magnetic line of force. Uh, so basically what this means is just when you go up high north or you go way down south, uh, like in the southern hemisphere toward Antarctica, uh, you're going to get malfunctions of your compass and it's eventually going to become basically useless. Uh, magnetic dip does have applications though anywhere in the world, uh, and that is acceleration and deceleration errors. So you can just imagine this when you're, you're flying here, you're moving along this track, uh, and you're heading to, um, well this compass is actually backward, it's pointing north that way and then it's got north here. So you're, you're heading west this way and you accelerate. Uh, if you think of this as something kind of hanging in your car, um, like a, a chandelier. Uh, you're in a, a large minivan and there's a chandelier in the back. As you accelerate, it's going to kind of swing backward behind you. And when you slam on the brakes very suddenly, it's going to swing up to the front because of its inertia. Uh, and that does apply to, to this as well. And so easy acronym is ANS. So accelerate north, decelerate south. That's, that's about all, all you need to know. Uh, northerly and southerly turning errors. Uh, aren't too important, but uh, just know that uh, as you turn to the north, uh, your your compass is going to get all excited about that and swing faster ahead of you and can end up overshooting. Uh, and the opposite can happen to, to the south. Uh, these errors do flip depending on which hemisphere you're in. Parallels and meridians. Uh, what's, what's the difference? Why uh, how do we tell them apart? So for latitude and longitude, uh, those are parallels and meridians. Uh, so uh, a well-planned modern city. So you end up with a grid work. Uh, grid works are obviously good. Uh, and because they're, they're, they're easy to identify and to navigate around. So we end up with meridians of longitude and we have parallels of latitude. Easiest way to remember that this uh, is lat is flat. Latitude is flatitude, whatever, however you want to say it. Latitude is just flat, it's, it's horizontal. Uh, so we end up with these parallels, these lines, these circles will not intersect. Uh, so the latitude of the North Pole is 90 degrees and South Pole uh, is also 90 degrees because if you measure from the inside of the earth, it's that angle upwards. So we're at 45 degrees uh, as our latitude here in Ottawa. So that means if we measured between the equator up to, so if we measure from the equator here and the North Pole is up here, then Ottawa is actually going to be right in the middle. Well, I suppose I should do it from the equator. So that is at 45 degrees. 
Uh, so here you can you can see them, and they they do get uh, they can get uh, stretched out. Uh, that 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 does happen. Uh, so here's those tropics I mentioned: the Tropic of Cancer and of Capricorn. Uh, I guess they're at 30. I think I'd said 15. Uh, Arctic Circle is up at 60, so the last 30 degrees up here, uh, and the Antarctic Circle is the last 30 degrees down here. Here's the equator. Uh, it is a great circle. It is the only parallel of latitude that is a great circle. All the other ones uh, are not. Meridians, uh, essentially the opposite. Oops. Uh, so uh, meridians of longitude are semi-great circles, meaning that they are half of a great circle. If you wanted to get from point A to point B, moving just north-south, you could follow a meridian of longitude because it, it is half of a great circle. Uh, the reason we just say half is because when they get around to that other side, uh, that does become another another reading. So you, you can't call them great circles, and that's just to avoid confusion. Uh, they are marked from the Greenwich or the prime meridian, uh, which is in uh, Europe, in England, and uh, they go around 180 degrees in either direction. There's no such thing as 360 uh, degrees uh, of longitude. You can you, There's not even such thing as uh, 181. You just go from uh, 179 east to 180 without specification. You could say east or west, it's the same thing. And you go from 179 east to 181 uh, east would become 179 west, if, you, if you, you get the meaning there. So here's the prime meridian, just, just for reference. International dateline, not important stuff, but just know that it's, uh, it's aimed to be around the opposite of this prime meridian, so it's over here at the very edge it would happen on on both sides and uh yeah it does cut around certain territories just to make sure that people are in the same time zones and stuff so um american samoa and hawaii are, are part of the the united states so they're kind of cut around by kiribati which is uh, a territory of uh another country i can't remember off the the top of my head but you can see how it does change there it's not not perfect uh, more international dateline stuff. You can see how it changes here. Uh, these are Alaskan islands from the states that do branch out. So again, that international dateline does curve around them uh, just to make sure that they're, they're experiencing the same day as the rest of uh, the United States. Time zones, again, I'm sure you guys are familiar with, so we're not gonna spend too much time. Uh, and I'm sure you know what geographical coordinates are. Uh, so think X and Y, just like on, on a typical graph. Uh, and those are, are proportional to these, uh, these latitudes and these longitudinal coordinates. So here, I, I do believe that this is the, uh, the coordinates of Ottawa, uh, or actually no, because again, we are, we are at 45. Uh, I don't know exactly where this would be. If any of you want to look this up, you're more than welcome to. Uh, and you can see it's been divided into minutes and seconds. Um, if you're not familiar with what a minute and a second are, uh, go go review your, your grade one and grade two notes and uh, get back to us. And so uh, basically each uh, degree is consisting of 60 minutes uh, and each minute has 60 seconds. Uh, and that's how we measure this. So you can see we go up to 55 here. If we went up to 60 seconds, then we'd just roll over to 47 minutes. So this, how we'd, we'd say this is, uh, we'd have 49 degrees, uh, 46 minutes, 55 seconds. Any, any questions can be emailed to me uh, through my, my Cadet Commander email, uh, if you're able to find that on the website or just uh, DM me over Discord. Uh, I would be, be happy to help you guys throughout the week.